Right. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Nelly, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. My, as she said, my name is Zana. Um, I hope everyone is staying safe and healthy during this time. And thank you to the University of the Underground for inviting me to this, uh, to this experience. <laughs> so um, firstly, I am Debele Superhero. Um, I'm a creative director. A lot of my work is inspired by the Ndebele culture because I grew up in the culture and I've sort of seen the significance as well as the richness of the culture and how it sort of applies to today's world. Uh, the topic that we are going to be talking about today is the art has awakened, freedom can be created. So most of you might be wondering what that means. How does art tie in with freedom and that whole thing? So I'm according to some teachings and legends in my culture, art make, the process of art making is a process of exchanging consciousness with the mediums that you're working with. So if you're an artist, you are constantly in conversations with the things that you are making. So it's never about the final product of what you're making but the conversation you are having with the materials, the conversation you are having with the story that you sort of want the art in that so we recognize art as a form of consciousness, as something that exists beyond human, beyond uh, the comprehension of human beings and beyond, you know, the physical space. And it's mostly about the freedom that can be created through art really goes into, uh, speaks about going deeper into art as well as, and the deeper you go, the more freedom you are able to sort of uh, create for, for, your, uh, for yourself. And so that's basically what uh, that statement means, that art has awakened freedom can be created. It's about surrendering to the art in order to go deeper into the topic that you want to address at a, at a particular time. Before we proceed to 2009, I just want to read you guys a quote that has stuck with me uh, since my university days, as Dr. Nelly has explained, and it's by Amanda Kabashe, who did a TED talk on alternative and complementary medicine in Africa. And it goes something like this. How do I explain to someone that my body is an antenna, that if you come to me and you are ill, I feel it in me. I don't have the words for what I know, but it happens. How do I explain that I get taught in dreams and visions that you may not take seriously because it is not your perspective and paradigm of how knowledge is shared, but that's what happens. For me, knowledge is multidirectional, multicultural, and across generation. So 2009, as well as the overall theme of my work speaks to that. It speaks to opening yourself up to unconventional ways of learning and unconventional ways of absorbing wisdom, as well as knowledge. Uh, 2009 is a project that speaks about a process of disillusionment, existentialism, as well as the process of surrendering. So it, it was a project that I had been thinking about and playing around with the idea for the past, I think, two years when I was having conversations with some of my friends who worked in corporate South Africa, and they were sort of battling existing in corporate South Africa and in this promised land, but going back to living in townships feeling alien even in their own life, feeling alien in their home as well as feeling alien in the, in the corporate space and trying to sort of balance um, the two. And so by virtue of that, co that conversation, it grew to me researching different shades of blue and different hues of blue. And the year 2009 is something that has been showing up in my life, most of, uh, most of the number nine particularly. And so um, I titled the project 2009 because of that as well as the fact that the color that I decided to use or the shade of blue that I decided to use is called Yenman Blue. And it was discovered at the University of Georgia by Mer Subramini, who's a scientist, and he was just playing around with different, you know, different chemicals. And then he just created this color. And for me, I love that particularly because it spoke to something about Africa as well, in a way that everybody thinks they understand because the continent is done. It has so many rich, um, rich gems in, in, in meditation, in spirituality, in science, and technology. So the, the discovery of the Yenman Blue speaks to, uh, it speaks to that experience. Uh, 2009, I, I developed the process, uh, the project, sorry, in a three-part series. Uh, I got the opportunity to be one of the ARP uh, residency winners. And ARP residency was based in Rome uh, with the Centro Lugi Desaro Center. 
and basically we needed to do two work in progress exhibitions as well as a final exhibition. So we needed to have an exhibition in Cape Town, Spain, as well as Rome. And so uh, during my time in, in Cape Town, I decided to explore the disillusion part of the project. So um, it is set in sort of this dystopian space where the subject is trying to, like I said, balance the different worlds, balance working in corporate South Africa and also living in a marginalized community and trying to sort of navigate that space, trying to figure out what it means for them. And um, there was a, a, a photo series that John Miller did. John Miller is a photographer based in South Africa and he took these drone shots of the surrounding neighborhoods of the of the city so most of what's surrounding cape town the city center are a lot of marginalized communities township it's something that we call townships which is where a lot of marginalized people live they are overpopulated as well as underserved by uh, by government and so this subject is sort of in an inceptive dystopian dream state and they go through a parallel universe of trying to where they are disillusioned about capitalism about industrialization and where they find themselves in that space. What does it mean to live in this over-industrialized and over-capitalized space? But I also know the, the, oh, the other side of capitalism and I've lived the other, the other side um, of, of capitalism. So I did a sound installation piece, uh, but I, I unfortunately cannot share it with you guys right now because it's currently not online. As a, It's a sound and sense installation and it requires like a whole other setting. And so um, basically that took the audience on a journey where they were in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the position of the subject of trying to understand the subject and understand the dream that the subject is unveiling. And so what I did is I used um, a type of uh, bamboo kelp that's found in oceans across the Atlantic as well as the, uh, the Pacific in the Southern um, Hemisphere. And the kelp is called Eclonia maxima. So I, what I did is usually in the city of Cape Town, especially in the richer neighborhoods, whenever the sea weed sort of washes up on shore, uh, they require that the municipality sort of takes it out and throws it away. They don't want to see it and things like that. And so through my research, I discovered that the kelp is actually fundamental for purifying the water in the ocean. And it's also fundamental for the soil on the shore. And so I use that as a... I, I use that as a comparison, comparing people who lived in marginalized communities in Cape Town and how they are used to sustain the city, and yet they are treated in a very discarding nature, kind of um, like the help. So this process, as the sound installation progresses, the subject gets very disillusioned for the first time, and they are questioning themselves, they are questioning how they relate to their life, they are questioning what's the point of even trying to get out, what am I getting out to? Where am I going? Because even when I do get out, I, it, I can't just get out alone. I have to take everyone else with me because of this, this sort of congested and overpopulated uh, space that we, that we sort of operate in. And so the existentialism leads to part two, which I explored in Spain called Umcha Petenzain. Umcha Petenzaini basically is like a legend in the Ndebele culture. Uh, an artist called uh, July Masangu wrote the song and talking about the politics of what happens when a king doesn't want to give up power. So I decided to use that legend or that story as like a foundation and a metaphor for the over-industrialized and over-commercialized world that we're living in right now that does not serve society anymore, that leaves most people in poverty, um, facing a lot of socioeconomic issues, and it's not really a very balanced way of existence nor is it uh, very sustainable. And so I decided to explore this existential crisis that the, uh, the artist goes through about, um, about watching and who is watching who. When we are existing in this over-industrialized, techno-intensive space, are we being watched? Are we, the, are we the subject of the things that we are watching? Are we not the subject? Where is the freedom? in constantly being watched? Is, is, are the things that we are consuming watching us or are, are we consuming, uh, are we watching them? And so there's a quote that I like from Astro Noise, which is a book um, from, um, which says, the camera on the missile tip was supposed to identify and track objects, but as it self-destructed, it multiplied. 
it is now not only identifying and tracking objects, but the devices embedded in them, their owners, their emotions and emotions, as well as most of their actions and communications. If the cameras in the tips of missiles were suicide cameras, the ones on cell phones are zombie cameras, cameras that failed to die. So this is an autonomy of images by Hito Sterl. And she speaks about the idea of watching and the idea of the gaze. I'm quickly going to send you guys the link um, to sort of uh, check out the video. And then um, once everyone's checked out the video, I will expand more on what, uh, what, is, what it is that the project. So I can share this with you. And the password, let me just share the password with you. And to clarify, this is your own work, right? Yes, this is my own work. Um, so the work that I, the only part that I collaborated with someone on was um, part three of 2009, which I will be discussing uh, as we progress. So, so everyone just make sure not to share that video as well, because, you know, Zana is planning to maybe, you know, sell it down. Yeah, I'm planning to exhibit it as well. I'm planning to play around with it as well. And also just do it in such a way that it fits the, the area that I'm in. So the one that you guys are going to see now is set in Spain and it's using a lot of inspiration from Alhambra and, and all of that. So yeah, you guys can check that out. I'll give you a minute or two to, to observe that. Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I will try, Mayana. I will try to sort of send you. Maybe I'll send the link to Dr. Nelly. And maybe because I could hear that she could access it. Um, so I'll try to, to send like the link uh, via email. And so we each had, with the residency that I was doing, we had a week to do a project. That's all you got to do, research everything. And so what I did is I went to, because our guest house where we were staying was next to Alhambra. And so I'd go there daily to just record the sounds of the people interacting with the space. And historically, Alhambra is one of the most sacred spaces. And so a lot of people, in, when I first went there, I, I lost my mind. I started crying because it was so intense um, in its intentionality, in the architecture, in the design. And so I started recording the sounds of the place, the water, people interacting with the space. And some of, there was this sort of thing that I was getting where the, I felt like the art was watching the people consume it, but not really consume it, but in a way trying to collect memory to remember themselves there. And so what I did is I took pictures of um, the different palaces in Alhambra and I converted them into binary code. And then I wanted to speak about the idea of inverting the gaze that when you are taking a picture, all you're doing is collecting a code. But do you remember the experience? Do you give the experience time to live through 
through your body? Do you give it time to, con do you give yourself time to be vulnerable with what it is that you are confronted with? So that project explores that is that in our ability, in our, in our, um, our strive to constantly try and collect memory, when I'm experiencing that in the moment and when do we allow the the things that we're trying to connect to to move us and to move through us so that we can have our own understandings um, of these different things so um Pete is basically about that it's basically about the tug of war and the existentialism of living in this over industrialized over commercialized space and and also having things such as within that space such as alhambra ancient alhambra that are very sacred that are very beautiful that force us to connect to deeper parts of ourselves and basically surrendering to something as big as Alhambra, which is connecting to the art, content, connecting to the intentionality in the building, connecting to the stories beyond yourself and your understanding of what you think or who you think you are in relation to the work. Uh, part three of the project is titled Numbers Kambe. In my language, it means let's go. Uh, throughout the years, it's evolved into a shoe. We actually, actually don't have it right now but we have a shoe called Amanamba Skambe, which are a form of shoe with the Ndebele paintings. I don't know if you guys have seen the Ndebele paintings on them. And basically they're usually worn with the traditional uh, regalia. And this, this part of the project speaks about, um, it speaks about surrendering. It speaks about allowing the art that is present to guide you. It speaks about surrendering to, uh, to the art, not letting it uh, limit you, not letting it, um, sort of confine you and going beyond that space of, of, of trying to, to exist and just exist. Um, I quoted um, a line from Mika, Mika White's book, uh, in, in the End of Protest, a new playbook for, for revolution. And it says, am I in a mind control experiment? Am I being programmed? I feel as if I have, woke, I have awoken prematurely from a brainwashing session. It isn't just the radio repeating encouragements to consume, consume, consume that strike me as bizarre. Everything around me, the laundromat, the newspaper I hold, the buses carrying moving advertisements zipping by outside feels, feels alien for a long moment. Our age of authoritarian consumerism is sustained by commercial propaganda. The ground of our struggle is humanity's mental environment. And this mental environmentalism that Mika speaks of, speaks about the things that we consume and how they impact um, the art that we make, how they impact the things that we ultimately uh, go into. So that's what this part of the project Dana, is about. Do yes? you want to tell them a bit about Mika White? Because we've not at all Ooh. speak about him and who he is and we kind of like, some okay. people made some reference to it, but- Oh, you know. okay. So maybe uh, Mika White is one of the founders of Occupy Wall Street and along with um, other movements that have tried to really dismantle um, this, the inequality and the inequality status quo in society today. Um, he wrote a book uh, called The End of Protest, a playbook for revolutions, and he goes through different uh, schools of thought and he explores different ways and uh, in innovative ways of protesting that haven't really been explored in the past. He speaks about how protest needs to advance and it needs to always reflect the times. It can be frozen in a time frame. So, for example, if people used to march to the town hall, Mikawat speaks about that entire um, that entire system might not work at certain times in history when revolution is needed. Therefore, um, protesters and activists need to rise up to meet the moment and to meet the times and to be in tune with the times that they're living in. So he speaks about innovation through revolution and he's basically one of my favorite uh, writers and I'm grateful to the University of, of the Underground for introducing me to his work and we actually got to, uh, when I was in New York last year, to have a talk by him telling us about this book, exploring all these different schools of thought, basically giving you the how-to in revolution, but also understanding that each revolution is different and it, it needs to be met at different, um, at different uh, phases. Um, in, the, in the book, he also goes into speaking about uh, a unified theory of revolution, which is subjectivism, which is you change your inner reality in order to change your external. He speaks about theogorism, which is a revolution that requires divine intervention that whole only God can save us. It speaks about voluntarism, um, whereby um, 
people make revolutions. He speaks about structuralism, forces outside of the human uh, experience, uh, make a revolution, things like the prices going up, the stock market, so varying things outside of, uh, outside of our control as human beings that dictate uh, the rise in revolutions. And in, in the book, actually, in his book, in page 192, he says, the activist who is able to simultaneously embrace all four theories of revolution has reached the highest level. It is crucial to remember that a unified theory is not an eternal theory. The activist must continue to adapt by pursuing a fourfold path that embraces voluntarism, stru structuralism, subjectivism, and theorism at varying degrees. The challenge is to determine the appropriate unification of these four theories that will result in a revolution. At some time in history, the correct part may be to combine each equally. At some times, it may be to proper emphasize theory at a higher ratio than the other three. At this moment in history, when the status quo has tremendous temporal power and voluntarism appears exhausted, I believe a greater emphasis on subjectivism, theorism will yield higher results. So each revolution in this case requires different things, according to Mika. And that's what you ultimate, when you go deeper into the space that I'm speaking of, of being open to unconventional things, of allowing the art to awaken within you, you are exposed, you, 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 you get, you find yourself in, in, in conversations or, you know, exposed to books such as this one, because it speaks to that, it speaks to new ways of existing and basically breaking down this, the status quo using different uh, approaches to revolution. And so allowing the art to speak, allowing intuition to also um, sort of come on the surface. Um, and, and so it's also really, uh, you know, controversial because what he's yes. basically saying, and that's what he said to all of you as well when you were in New York, is that he basically think that Occupy Wall Street was a failure, that it actually didn't work because yes, it yes. meant that the five percent were when the five percent anymore. So there is also a part of him, and that's what he's saying there, that uh, says that basically maybe actually revolution requires violence, and maybe yes. actually it requires authoritarian regimes to some level. Uh, so he kind of like really is really a controversial figure, which you know we encourage you all to kind of have a look into. <laughs> yes, he is. Uh, he is quite controversial, and I think that it sometimes you need we need the the controversial to disturb. Uh, the norm. We needed to disturb the norm because for as long as we are in sort of the same system, we become very, um, we become very nonchalant to it. We accept it as reality, even when it doesn't have to be. So exploring other means of, of protest, exploring other means of revolutions without accepting uh, things at face value. Um, in some of the links that I had given to Dr. Nelly, I put, um, the link to my website, which is the surrendering part. Uh, and you guys will check it out in the document in the references. And basically, that's when the subject decides that they don't want to do this anymore. And so they surrender. And so um, they come back home. And there's a cutting of hair ceremony in my culture, which uh, is a symbol of rebirth. And they basically are going into an unknown space without trying to configure are uh, trying to predetermine what that space will hold for them. And so the project uses the Ndebele symbol of rebirth, which is the cutting of the head to symbolize the subject's preparation of going into an unknown space and plane of existence, leaving behind years of what is and what is not, as well as the in-between. A space of fluidity where the art that is manifest what the, where the art that is a manifested idea is projected in the form of expression through the artist has awakened and the freedom created can manifest in real life. So it is an invitation to the audience. The project is basically an invitation to the audience to look beyond, you know, the circumstances and to go in the face of the world, to trust own internal guidance systems to trust that where they are going is where they need to be and they don't have to constantly doubt because that then keeps you in a cycle of fear and it keeps you in a cycle of not really moving forward with uh with anything so yeah and in this part of the project i worked with an amazing photographer his name is john baloy um, i worked with him in a lot of my projects and we sort of have a good visual um, language with each other. So you guys can check that out as well. It's all on, on my website. And I've also put the links uh, on, the, on the document I shared with, with Dr. Nelly. 
Yeah, so do you guys have any questions? Questions, go comments. Uh, okay. Well, it usually take a bit of time for them to, you know, can you hear me? Sorry, you froze. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can hear you. So do you want to tell us a bit more about what's the kind of the latest development of the project with the, uh, uh, especially the one uh, that you so with the, uh, um, with the, with the latest um, developments with uh, 2009, I'm currently going into a diff uh, the, It's like a continuation because at the end, uh, when you go, when you look at the images on the website, the last image, the subject is covered by a calabash on their on their face, and so the calabash acts as an eye um, to see. So basically, moving blinded with one eye. And so in the next project, I'll be exploring a lot of, um, a lot of indigenous uh, South African plants uh, in the next phase of the project. Once, what, what happens when you surrender? Because it's not easy. It's not like you surrender and then it's like flowers everywhere <laughs> and everything is great. No, it, it, there, is, there are other things that you confront uh, in that space. I don't want to say too much about it because I'm also really, really excited about it. But that's the next development, sort of the next, what happens when you surrender, that space of isolation, that space of loneliness, that space of not being misunderstood, that entire uh, paradigm. So I'll be exploring that in the, in the next phase and, of, of, of the project. And Zana, do you want to tell them a bit more about the Ndebele, which is... Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the Ndebele culture is a very small um, ethnic group uh, based in South Africa as well as Zimbabwe. Um, our history dates back to the 14th uh, century. Uh, there's, there's a lot of theories about where the Ndebele's came from. I mean, the stories that my grandmother told me are different from the things that I'm reading um, online. So there's a the theory that the Ndebele people uh, came from uh, the Natal region and they came during the Shaka Zulu uh, regime and then they came through Mzilakazi who was a leader as well and so then through that movement they migrated down, they migrated up uh, mm. up north in South Africa and then some of them settled in the current area now called Kwandebele which is Mpumalanga and others moved to Zimbabwe um, some of the theories, when you look at some of the ancient texts that uh, my grandmother used to tell me about, the Ndebele people are known as the sorghum people. They were the original farmers. So there's that, there's that um, story of origin that talks about them in that light, where they, they were some of the original farmers, or some of the people that were given the seeds to farm and to expand, were very expensive people. Uh, one of the greetings um, in Ndebele, when someone says how are you or when they when you're just in conversation and they say to aguande you know when they greet you and that is, is translated into let it be abundant so they've always been very um i would say very spiritually inclined people uh which you've also seen in a lot of their art you um, i don't know if you guys are familiar with esther masangu's work where she does the ndebele house paintings uh with the symbol writing so that's something that has been uh been done for the past, I would say, 500, if not more, years of Nebela women using art to express themselves and creating spaces for themselves for vulnerability, creating spaces for therapy, creating spaces for healing, creating spaces for innovation. So Nebela culture is a very small ethnic group. However, it's very rich in, in its culture and it's very rich in its heritage. And yeah, and, and that's basically... Do you want to tell them the role of dance as well into the Ndebele culture? Because, you know, they have a, a project at the moment which is about dance and how dance can be used as a means to build new politics and you know, new form of revolutions. And I know, and I remember seeing some pictures of your brother, I think, going yes. to a special tradition in the Ndebele culture. So maybe you can tell them a bit about that too. Um, with us, uh, I would say dance and with a, lot of, with a lot of African cultures, dance is about it's like you are responding because remember art is not dead. Art is not a stagnant thing. So you are responding to vibration. So for instance, if they are playing a drum, 
-hmm. when you get up to dance there's no choreography that like that's preconceived before that you are getting up to dance to meet the vibration and so then your body becomes a vessel where the where where the vibration uh, sort of channels through it's present in a lot of a lot of the ceremonies in the Ndebele culture a lot of the initiations as dr nelly has said when my little brother uh, went to initiation in 2017 when they came out there was a lot of dance there was a lot of a song and through uh, dance, through dance, through music, the Ndebele people have used it to create um, an energy circle. I'll make an example with um, Ndebele women. Mm. So traditionally, we don't have like a therapist where you go to a therapist and you sit down and you tell her how you feel. So what we had, our form of therapy was married women got together. Even young, even young girls have a similar things, but married women get together uh, when there's a ceremony in someone's house. And then that woman comes into, they create like a sound, um, a sound circle for her. And then using this other instrument called impalampala. Um, it's, it's pretty far, it's in my room. But yeah, it's using that sound piece. It's like very long. You'll see it on my Instagram as well. I, I think there's a picture where I'm holding it. And that instrument was used to create a, a, an energy circle for women to purge. So a woman would get on with the, the former circle and then a woman would come into the center and then she'd speak about all her ills in her marriage. She'll speak about all the things that she's facing, all the things that she's confined, her fears, her anxieties. And so then the, in that moment, there's no judgment. There's no, you can do better. And then another woman gets up and then she purges her pain. So song, music, dance, and they're all dancing has been used as, as a way of healing as well, as a way of purging pain in a world that sometimes is very lonely. So when these women get together, there's a sisterhood that formulates and they are able to express themselves without feeling judged. Like if, for instance, they're in a marriage and want to enter and this space allows us to speak about that, to explore that. And so they don't have to post that experience, post the, the, the dance and the music. You don't have to speak about it beyond that if you don't want to. If you want to go deeper into that space, they will allow you. But no woman after that is going to come to you and say, Oh yeah, you, you are only, you are the one who's guiding them through your own, through your own pain, through the purging. And then they also get up and they speak about their pain. So it's like a, it's like a, so using sound and dance and sort of like group healing, using a sound and dance to go deeper and to go further. You have a question from Michaela. Where are you, Michaela? Hey. Um, hello. Um, so I wanted to know if you could possibly speak a little bit about working with your own body as an artist and maybe how your relationship to your body as a material, uh, which has embodied knowledge, it's archiving, you know, your own personal history. How has this evolved over time in your practice? Um, the, for the most part, uh, the reason why I've decided to use my body was because most of the stories, um, like I said, come to me in very unconventional ways, um, that, I'm, that I speak about. And then sometimes it's like, it's it's like light or sometimes it's a dream or sometimes so it's very unconventional ways and some and trying to articulate it i haven't been really good at articulating it and to relate to someone else so what i've done is that the reason why i've used this, my, my body as an instrument is that the minute i get on set of any project i let go of whatever preconceived ideas i have about what this needs to look like uh when i when i first started out i wanted to control everything i wanted to be like I need to, why is it? And then I'd get stuck there. And I saw that that style of working for me limited my ability to go further. And some, so then the more I let go when I got on set and I just surrendered to the project, the more was revealed in the story that I was able to see things that I hadn't planned for. I was able to be flexible in how the story evolves. So I could have a treatment, a production, you know, production Bible, everything. We do obviously do all of it. We do mood boards. Everything is planned out. Then we get on set. And it's just, especially when I shoot in Pumalanga, because it's a very spiritual place for me, it just takes on a different direction. I'm like, oh my goodness, where did you go? So it's about trying to, um, the reason why I've used myself as an instrument is because I have created op an opening within myself for the story to, to move through in a way that I don't know if someone else uh, would be able to. And you have a comment from Tong. Where are you, Tong? We love your comments. Is she gone? Uh, I didn't get. Ah, Tong, yeah. you're back. So, you're, we like your comments. So, 
but make make maybe try and make them a question. <laughs> Go ahead. I don't know. Okay, maybe I mean it's something that you can possibly respond to because there's a lot to attach to. But I was thinking of the work of Freshly Phillips or that quantum futurism. I don't know if you're familiar with them. Um, yeah. They're really cool, but they're really I mean they're based in America. The context is completely different, of course. Um, but they are about you know taking kind of Afrofuturist um, principles and applying it to underserved communities, particularly in. I forgot where they're from, never mind. Um, <laughs> um, is it Pittsburgh or something? I don't know. Um, so, but I went to a workshop with them one time and I really like that you mentioned um, this kind of journey of uh, moving from the township to, you know, more urban spaces and then somehow feeling that we're disconnected, that you're not necessarily a one belonging to one or the other wholly in that sense anymore because of that kind of journey. And I felt that, you know, a similar situation with myself, you know, like coming from a small country uh, and then also being edu highly educated to like a master's degree level and then like wanting to express a lot of things, but also feeling not, not having the right to express those things because I'm technically quite privileged in that respect, you know, like the people that apparently are underserved are people who aren't me, who aren't educated or don't necessarily have the access to resources in the same way that I do. However, one thing that kind of changed my mind on that kind of relationship was that workshop I did with uh, Black Quantum Futurism where they invited a bunch of um, activists in London who had been worked with um, housing issues and uh, in experiencing domestic violence and one of them was this uh, woman who uh, typically wears a burqa on a daily basis and she calls herself veiled so I will continue to use the word veiled from now on um, and she was basically being um, forcibly evicted by the council and uh, because she lived in the council for that but she had been fighting them challenging this eviction legally for like three years and the really interesting things that she said was like yes this is an inspiring story and stuff but like the what makes this story an inspiring story is the fact that this council made an assumption that this woman was inarticulate, unable to defend herself based on her appearance of wearing a burqa for being veiled because they assumed that women so she said you should not focus on me you should focus on the people that they made the assumption correctly about that were inarticulate that looks like me and she puts herself out there now to speak to kind of like break that so i think what you do is really important in that kind of aspect of being that kind of antenna let's say for these kind of different communities and the spaces you exist in and i think that's important for most people to kind of feel within themselves you know it's not i i, I really don't i would really hate for my work to be about myself and to be something like an intellectual property in that pure sense it needs to belong to something more than who I am because I don't want to capitalize on pain in that kind of way but yeah 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 um for me like uh, some of those actually 2001 was a very challenging project for me because it confronted pain in a way that I hadn't confronted it before because I was really trying to not be a part of the narrative of just like sadness and like Africa oh my gosh we are so oppressed uh, you know, like that. And it's just like colonialism has messed us up quite a bit. Yes. Mm -hmm. But I didn't want my work to be focused on that. And so even in the visual representation um, of the images, I try to, to present, even though I'm talking about real things and real issues, I try to present um, I try to present positive things because those things get to live in people's minds. And so I'm aware of um, the position So it's, it's like, it's constantly like at a balance of trying to say, okay, this is what I need to say, but how do I want to say it? How do I want to portray? How is it true to me as well? As much as I'm speaking about everybody else, it still needs to be, it still needs to be true to, to you. 
Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I also put, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Nana Oforiata Ayim. He's a Ghanaian oh, okay. artist that is trying to uh, basically make a kind of, I think, encyclopedia of culture in Africa, you know, to kind of yes. like, yeah, yeah. So is, I, I went to a lecture from her one time then. It was great. I, I'm kind of getting this weird vibe <laughs> of like, oh, I show up to events like made by black people, but that's, no, I go to everything. So yeah. I'm not, I'm not a, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to stop. Uh, but we, um, do you want to tell us a, a bit about like, you know, there is a, also a belief. I mean, I found it interesting that every time there is a, also a piece of work that comes from Africa, then it's labeled Afrofuturism. What do you what do you think about it, um, Zana? Um, with Afrofuturism, I, I feel that um, I think that it's a it's a it's a great uh, concept and it's a great movement because it, it it's very inclusive of not just people who are on the continent but people as who are also in the diaspora as well. And I think that it adds a different layer and a different element to what Africa can be and its descendants. So I think that it's something worth exploring and I think that it, it, has, it has a place, um, even not just you know, in the West, but as well as in Africa and just providing new perspectives because that's where the evolution is. Evolution lies in new perspectives. Yes, it is important to be aware of where you come from. It is actually fundamental, but it is also important to create and to evolve beyond um, that space. Like for me personally, uh, I would say an example of that was the evolution of the Ndebele regalia. Before we wore these beads that I have on today, there's a type of plant that grows in nature that used to grow beads for us, but we've evolved and then we started using these beads. So evolution is, I think that the misconception is that Africa is like completely closed off to um, evolution and moving forward, but it is not. A lot of cultures are actually great at adapting. A lot of cultures are great at setting trends for themselves to move forward, to see what works, to, to sort of embrace what, what, what works now and to let go of what no, what no longer works. Because some, some of the teachings in my culture are about change. They're about the inevitability of change. So you need to always be in a space to receive change, but to not forget who you are. So it's always about what doesn't work anymore? And so, okay, that doesn't work. Okay, we let, that, we let go of that. What works now? So it's always about moving on and evolving. That, I think, is how a culture of any, uh, of any, uh, any origin is able to, su to survive, is if it evolves and it reflects the times as well as the people who are living uh, at the time. You have a question from Shameli. Shameli, are you here? Shameli. Um, yeah, hi. Um, <laughs> I just, uh, yeah, I really loved what you were saying about the um, the practice in, is it in your culture when kind of the women uh, gather around and they have the instrument and I really like the, I really love the um, idea of incorporating sound in healing um, and I find that with a lot of kind of non-Western practices, uh, it's very much about just conversation and dialogue and not about kind of the surrounding and um, kind of elements like what you're watching or what you're hearing as well. It's quite a multi-sensory experience that I find that you've been talking about. I wonder if you have like any other kind of examples of um, kind of non-Western healing practices that you've come across that are kind of incorporating that as well. Um, some of the practices, which is what I tried to include in my installation uh, in 2009 part one, whereby I created a scent infused installation. So people would come into the space and I had been burning, relaxing um, herbs like the indigenous lavender, for instance, in the space. And so the purpose, the main purpose of that herb is for you to relax. It's not like, it's not weed, but like it's just meant to sort of put you in a very relaxed state and you are more open to receiving information. So a lot of healers have used it to try to get people to just open themselves up. And so I tried to, because of the, situ the, the setting that I was in when I did um, my, my, uh, my, my presentation in the installation in Cape Town, the, the, the audience was predominantly white because we were in a white area. 
So then I wanted to create a space where it's not like, oh my God, it's aggressive, but to create a space of conversation and hearing as well. And so by burning that thing, it doesn't matter if you're from Africa or you're from, you know, you, it doesn't matter where you're from, plants operate the same in our bodies. And so by burning that, um, that lavender and sort of inducing the sun in this um, in space, the people were able to receive the things that I was talking about much better than they would have been if they just, because they would have just walked in and sort of engaged very separately from the art. So the more I go into this uh, art making space, I want to create more work that, that is based on feeling, but that also invites the audience into the engagement that the audience is not watching the art but they themselves are also a part of um a part of the the art making process as well so they are invited in and it's something that I, like i said i draw a lot of inspiration for my culture it's something that i've seen in practice in my culture that even if you can't dance the minute someone starts playing drums everybody is dancing there's no right way to dance there's no wrong way to dance it's everyone is just feeling in that moment and there's a there's an energy that is sort of in the space at the time that is quite is quite intoxicating and it, it, it I feel like words fail to describe the experience but you need to feel it you need to feel, feel it and decide what what it what it generally uh, means for you so yes definitely I've been exposed to um, other mediums and I'm also trying to expose them within my own practice things like water healing I'm um, there's a tribe, I forgot the name in Africa, that goes into the water and uses and basically hits on the water to create sound for healing. So the women go there into the river, they, they go waist deep and they just start hitting the water. And there's like a sound, there's actually a melody that comes out of that in order to heal, in order to connect to the water. Because you are, you are not a, 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 a you know, one dimensional being. There are so many, and a lot of ancient cultures uh, believe this too, that you are such a multi-dimensional um, being that you are not just your body. There's so many layers to you and to your existence. And it's, it's only right to honor even those spaces and to not just choose to just honor the physical, but to honor everything else that makes you, you. Thank you. Zana? Yes. Can I just say that uh, every time I hear you talk and every time I see you, I always yeah. think that, you know, really like, you, you know, there is a part of me that thinks that if you were in politics, the world would be so different. And I just wonder if, you, you know, are you, are you interested in that? Like, I know that you've been <laughs> in politics and so forth, but is there, because speech is something that you master as well as, you know, the arts and creative direction and so forth. So um, is something that is going on in the family, is your dad somehow or your parents are somehow involved in politics or what is it that makes you like you, you are very special, I must say. <laughs> um, so with my dad, um, not now, but my dad before he before post apartheid South Africa, my dad was a photographer. And he worked for the Gwande Bene government. And so a lot of his friends were like um, in politics. He was also in politics. He worked in the Department of Education at some point. And so there was a lot of things maneuvering in that space in pre-democratic South Africa. And my, my mom hates politics. <laughs> um, so uh, for me, I, because I studied politics and I know how it's made and I know what goes on, I, you know, before the people actually see, you know, the whole president thing, how elections are made, the being exposed to that kind of created a very bitter taste in my mouth about politics and politics is way of, of implementing change. And so I think that's why I opted for a more artistic approach to it, because then there are no lobbyists, there's no one who sort of is relegating how I would should say what I'm saying. It's, it's very expressive phase. And so what I found in traditional uh, politics is that it was all, it's, it's tweaked too much before it gets to the people. There's too much of it being, you know, tweaked. And by the time it gets to the actual people whose lives it's supposed to change, it's been tweaked to a point where people who this thing is trying to talk to doesn't, they don't even identify with it anymore. So I think the, the knowing of what goes on in the, in the background of politics really created a very um, bitter taste in my mouth. <laughs> uh, Lawrence is saying Zana 2020. Is that Lawrence? The <laughs> we know? It's Lawrence, yeah. Yeah, it's I think. Oh, Lawrence. Where is he? <laughs> yes. Oh my God. <laughs> hey, Lawrence. <laughs>
So Lawrence was also uh, was also an alumni <laughs> from the New York crew, where and you've been involved in politics as well. But things are going quite bad in I'm the US. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, nothing is going very well in the US right now, but there are good things. <laughs> wow, your so ear. Fun, it's amazing to have you. It's super early for you, isn't it? It's like Yes, it's uh it's a 5 a.m. here? 5 a.m., yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, Lawrence. We really, really appreciate you getting up at 5 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> really well, appreciate Only for you, Zana. Only for you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, that entire politics space, ew, it's a lot. It's really, like, a lot. So I'm trying to figure out ways using creativity, using art. Like, I want to go into developing a lot of things. I want to go into developing textiles. There's so many things. And, and this was because of the New York experience, because I was so open to it. I was able to learn new ways of communicating the things that I want to communicate. So the New York trip and also as well as my other travels have really opened me up to different mediums of expression. And my, the video is actually was my, my first time doing video alone. The silence piece is also was my first time. I got some help with some friends who had like equipment and everything, but I'd never explored that. So uh, the University of the Underground, what it did for me was give me the courage to do the things that I don't think I can do. And so it's, it's really, if you really take this program and you are open to it, um, it can really change your perspective and it can really change how you approach uh, your practice as well. There's a lot of things, obviously, that don't go right. There's a lot of politics, even within the, the it's important to remember why you are there and to remember that you are here for not nothing else so it's important to 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 capitalize off that and to really be open uh to the different things that um you guys get to be exposed to unfortunately you guys can't travel and go everywhere that we went but the information that at uh, the university sharing with you is very fundamental and i, I really take advantage of this time and really just dig and in, go into the work dive in and i'm telling i they are, they are, they are, they are still to read Oh dear. Sorry, my internet crashed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> this happens a lot. <laughs> I understand. I understand. I'm surprised mine hasn't crashed yet. <laughs> it's getting bad. I don't know why. Like some days it's good, some days it's up and down. So but we made it at least an hour. So without too yes. much. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Uh -huh. Thank you so much for your time. I don't know if there has been any other question between the time that I disappeared from the screen. <laughs> but uh, Dana, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you with us. Thank you as well to Lawrence from your crew to come and support. I think it's amazing to you know see that you're all supporting of each other. Uh, and uh, please join in for all of the next sessions or you know we hope to see you soon. And yeah, definitely consider politics as well as the <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. No, Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, so Dr. Nelly. Thank you to everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye bye. Okay, I'm going to stop this thing if I stop it somehow. <laughs>